to map out this carving for the drawer front um, I had to pull out a bunch of notes from 20 years ago and um, some photographs and things um, I didn't measure all the components I didn't measure how big are these um, half circles I know the drawer front is four and a quarter inches tall and that it's 36 and an eighth inches long and that this pattern repeats on there three times uh, one thing you can see in the overall of the drawer front is there are two fields that interrupt these three repeats and those fields are where the drawer pulls are so these aren't then 12 inches long these repeats they're less than that uh, and I had from all those years ago some rubbings that were given to me uh, of parts of these carvings and from this rubbing I was able to determine that uh, the left to right length of this pattern is 11 and a quarter inches so I had the height and I had the length and then it's a matter of just filling in uh, the three arcs that form the top of this um, this pattern um, a couple of things that I had to then determine one is the margins top and bottom and on one end and the other end are quite narrow compared to the band of the carvings you see it in the photograph uh, you know the margin is narrower than this business is uh, so I just eyeballed that and my margins are about uh, right about a quarter inch maybe just a little shy of that uh, so there is no margin here where it bumps into the field where the drawer pull will be so then it's a matter of taking this distance from here to the inside margin and dividing it into thirds that distance let's see what it measures it's about 10 and 15 sixteenths uh, I can't wrap my head around math enough to then say oh 10 and 15 sixteenths divided by 3 is this you can and I have at times used compass and just I uh, just by guess and by gory pick out a spacing walk off the distances and say all right I need to increase it and with trial and error come to that spacing very easy to do just takes you a couple of a uh, couple of stabs sometimes what I did the other day when I mapped out this um, uh, drawing was just extended those lines down on my paper put the corner of a ruler on the left hand margin and then put 12 inches here and I can divide 12 into thirds easily it's 8 and 4 so I made those two marks and then took a t-square and just carried those marks up to here and to there and that gave me my spacing for the diameter of that circle and then uh, the half of that is the radius of it which allowed me then to draw those um, those arcs I'll show you on the piece of oak how I scribe those it's easier with a compass on wood than it is with a compass and pencil on paper and um, and then we'll look at the carving and whether to do it with uh, the outline with a v-tool or with gouges uh, the, once I answer that question then carving it will be just very simple one last thing before I go on I talked about the carving being 11 and a quarter inches and mine is 11 and an eighth and the reason for that is my drawer opening and drawer front came out to be four and an eighth instead of four and a quarter so I wanted to squish it a little this way because I had uh, by 
just by fate squished it vertically. Uh, so if you're following along in the math, you might think, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. And that's why. It's because the piece was shrunk this way, so I reduced it a little bit that way. And maybe that gives me a little broader part here for that drawer pull. Uh, my field for the drawer pull will now be an inch and seven sixteenths. And the drawer pull itself is about an inch in diameter. So that'll work out pretty well. Now on to the oak. This is a scrap piece of oak that I've marked this out on. I'll uh, show you what I did with the compass. So once you've got your margins and center line and your spacing and everything figured out, then you set your compass and scribe that arc coming below here. And now you lean on this leg and swing it the other way. And then that leg becomes the next center point. You lean on it and swing this way. And then lean here and swing that way and so forth. When you do the inside arcs, you reset your compass, of course. But now you have to scribe that line and then pick it up and go to the next center line. It's only the outer ones, the first ones, that you can walk it. Now you have to lift it each time. Otherwise your circles, your half circles, won't come out concentric. So that's the layout. It's very easy to do. And now we'll look at um, the V-Tool. There is a video on YouTube here of me carving this pattern last year. And you see it's a similar notion, these uh, opposing lunettes. It's a common pattern, the details of which vary. And in this case, I used the V-Tool to outline it. And you can watch that and see how it's all done. It's quite straightforward. But the basic, uh, or the most common way to hold the V-Tool is just like that with the the edges of it, the top of it, parallel to your bench. As I'm coming around this arc, you see that the shape of the tool is such that the wings are are canted left and right. That's how it forms the V. And that results in the the edge of this band leaning this way. Now, I think the carving I'm looking at today isn't like that. It seems to me that the edges are straight down. Now, you could do that by tilting the V-tool so that that wing on this side is vertical and that one is tilted way over. It's not easily done. And then just the reverse coming the other way. So that can result in this being pretty much a, a straight uh, cut on the edge of that field. But another way to get that is with a gouge. This one I struck with that gouge. And here I've got the tool pitched over, but the camera's in the way. But striking vertically straight down. And that, I think, creates when you then cut the background away. That creates the edge I'm after in this particular carving. So a couple of things need to happen. You need to find a gouge that will follow that arc uh, closely. 
and then it's just a little slower but I'm gonna get up the drawer front and show you how I carve it. I picked out a few different tools to try to outline just the arcs uh, and just the outside of the arcs to begin with and these are three uh, modern carving tools of the Swiss made company and they are all number fives and you could use any one of these to do it um, the narrow one you'd be nibbling along making a lot of cuts and each one has to sort of overlap its predecessor and be kind of a choppy result so the narrow one is out this one is i think an inch wide nearly so and it's a pretty good one uh, again it take a few strikes to march along that circle there well if i did it down here you might see better what i'm looking at so just trying to see how it works along those lines so i opted for the wide one and it is an inch and three eighths so let me show you how i do this I set it right on that line and I tilt it just a little bit forward and strike it like that and so for you who hate using the v-tool because it's hard to learn how to control this is a good alternative just a little bit slower but on a scale like this not that bad like that And then I go up um, this way. Now to incise the inside of the circles, I could use the same tool it looks like, but it looks like it wants to turn a little more than this is able to. Might be close. What if I switch to the narrower one? That'd be a little more forgiving. Maybe it will. Let's try it. This is a point where I need to be careful because I'm running right along the fibers of the wood and you can split it if you're uh, not careful right there. So that's the inside arc and you can see how this wider tool is just coming out of there so it was good to step down to the slightly narrower you can almost get away with it here but it's still peeking out just a little bit right there and again the long cut right there where you gotta watch it a little One thing I want to show you very briefly uh, is the way I'm carving for a video or for still photographs is not how I carve. Uh, when I'm confronted with a three foot long section like this with a repeat of one pattern, 
I don't carve this chunk and then move over and carve that chunk in this one. I carve the whole row. So I'd make this cut here at my bottom left and I'd strike those three cuts and move over to the next lunette and go likewise. These I've already struck, so I'd be hitting them harder than this. And then I'd come here and go bang, bang, bang. And the concept there is a basic one. You can immediately see the benefit. You're in one position. You've got the tool held in one position. And you just keep marching down the line. It speeds up your work. It makes it more consistent and less wear and tear on you. You're not fumbling around, picking up tools, putting them down and changing your, uh, your posture. So then I would go uh, on this inside. Like that. And now step over to the next one. Make the same cuts on the next one. And so on and so forth. So that's just something to think about that I don't often get to touch upon. As it happens, I'm going to save that last third for some still photography as well. Uh, carving for the camera is different than carving to get the carving done. All right, on to the next part. The next piece I'm going to do are these little half circles that stem from the margin, fall between all the lunettes. And to do them, I've got this gouge. Uh, it's an antique, and the circle it defines is 5 eighths of an inch. And it is a little narrower than that, about 9 sixteenths. So I just stand it. Uh, about in the middle I eyeball it and strike it on the margin there like that and then just leapfrog over like that and that's really all it amounts to like that the margin um, cutting perpendicular to the board is easy like that. Uh, I'm using a straight chisel in this case that is uh, three quarters of an inch wide. You want to be careful this way again for risk of splitting especially where that margin is so narrow and so I tend to strike this a little lighter than I was and I've tilted the chisel away so the bevel is sort of plumb that might not be necessary what if I bring it more upright I just want to be careful essentially I'm driving a wedge into that wood and it has all this mass here and very little back there. So there is a risk of that breaking out. So you do need to strike those uh, lightly at first to get a feel for the, your particular piece of wood. And then you can go from there. One thing about this design is it's um, not cut very deep. So that's a good thing in this case. And next, I'll look at the um, the decoration that goes inside the lunettes. So now the bit that um, well, I'll show you. Next, I want to do these pieces, these three uh, lobes, or I don't know, they're fleur-de-lis maybe, I don't know. 
but these three little that go around here and for those I've chosen a just a slightly narrower gouge this one's a half inch circle and it's a half inch wide if you're uncertain about how your tool is going to perform if it's the right size and shape you can take a pencil before you go striking anything and trace around like that and see what you get and what I'm finding here is that maybe this is too small because the top one should span that center line right there and mine doesn't right now so I might go back to the tool I used for these which would make sense in that it would be one tool to do the whole thing. Use a cabinet scraper to erase that. And do the same step with the next gap. So, because this gouge is a little bigger, it can come all the way around to here and then span that uh, across that center line like that. So, this is the tool I want. That's the ticket. It might be a little big compared to the original, but to me it's more important that they reach that middle like that. So those are what have been a strike. And once you've determined the tool, you don't need to draw everyone. Here, I didn't quite connect those two, so I'll go back and restrike that a little bit. Now, if you have a hard time doing the upside down ones, you can flip the board around, but you should be able to get the hang of it. With some practice, sometimes you do them this way, sometimes you do them that way. And oh, I forgot some of my chisel work, so I'll finish that chisel work. Oh, and half these here and there. I'm forgetting everything.
here I did yeah so I just need a narrow chisel to hit those two parts And at that stage, it's ready to cut out the background. Cutting the background, I use the same tool for almost every carving. And um, it's that narrow number five in the Swiss made, it's half an inch wide. So the circle it defines, if you chased it all around, would be an inch and three quarters. So it's very shallow. And all I'll do, I'll use hand pressure, and I'm right near all those incised cuts I made. And I'm just relieving right around there. Not really taking the background out yet, but... cutting down to sort of set off the uh, carving. Because it's so shallow, it's fairly safe. You've heard me maybe say before that hand pressure, you run a greater risk of slipping than with a mallet. So to sort of ensure against that, what I'm doing, I've got the tool pitched up fairly steep, not way down low like that. And with my left hand, pinching it between my fingers and thumb right near where the cutting is happening. And then I'm just pushing downward with my right hand. There's times when I switch those hands and alternate them depending on where I need to get at. Another grip to hold it this way. But again, steep. So it's coming down into that cut. And the wood will break out right there at the um, incisions you've made. And I'll go around and do the whole pattern this way. Setting that out. And similar to what I was talking about earlier, I'm working on all of the cuts right now Whoops that are to the right of these incisions. I've not turned around and come back this way. I'll do a whole batch of them here. So you can see it here. And the chip comes up as you reach the depth of that cut you made.
That one didn't let go, so then I rock that tool left and right. And there it is. So I'll finish setting that out and then show you how to take out this background here. Now I will go to the mallet and start to break those chips out right like that to just take the bulk of that background down. Being careful not to hit any of the um, solid part I want to keep. And now the gouge is at a very low angle. And this is just about getting the bulk of the wood out of there now. Not about producing the finished surface yet. Here there's less room to maneuver. And sometimes you'll go across the board instead of along it. And it's actually easier to control your depth that way. And I'll try to get you a view showing you the angle of the tool. Remember when I was relieving right at the edges it was very steep. Now it's down much lower as I just am coming along the board to catch those things, take them out like that. For the final background, uh, this one is a little different than many of my other carvings, than most of my other carvings. Um, if you've watched me before, usually I'll punch that background with a toothed punch to create a texture on it. And if I don't do that, I'll leave a lot of gouge facets there, both of which are things I see on period carvings. This particular one is very flat and very carefully smoothed um, so the facets are really very slight there is no textured punch so this is back to hand work with the gouge low angle like that and just starting to blend all those resulting facets together and a lot of back and forth It creates a very uh, tidy sort of background. It's not one I'm particularly taken to in part, I think, because it's hard to do. Uh, it's just a little slower than the more typical backgrounds. And so here I've got the row of facets when I had that gouge very steep and going down there. So I'll try to mow down those by coming along that arc. So I'm using just a little bit of the tool and sort of scooping like that as I come by there. I know I just cast a shadow on that. But so that takes out some of them those gouge cuts and now I've got a little bit of a ridge and going about 45 degrees to the fibers of the board to the, the long grain of it like that now up here do some of the same sort of stuff but just go over that whole interior and these little spandrels 
try to take as many of those facets down as I can. That one I have to get at uh, when the camera's moved. Let's see. Yeah. It's a little hard to get at from here. And this one, same sort of scenario is just a second ago, but coming down this way. So I have, so now I'll come like that. Just sweeping down there. And see the difference. I have a little ridge still right there at that juncture. But that's the sort of thing I'm after. Taking those facets down. bound to be some but in this style of carving you want to really blend them as much as you can got the drawer front all carved and then got some raking light on it in the afternoon and found it was still more scalloped and faceted than I wanted it to be here you can see the surface as I left it um, when I thought I was done. And it's just too too many facets for this particular pattern. Uh, ordinarily, that would be fine with me. So I went back and I found a carving gouge. This is a, uh, an English one. It's an Addis is the name. It's, they're considered some of the best carving tools going. And it is just about nearly flat and I have gone over what I thought was done uh, with this tool and I'm just trying to even out some of those facets and coming in very low like before but just with a tool even flatter than that Swiss made number five and again a rounded end to it so it'll meet those shapes easily.